The man strolling through a public park in Fairfax County, Virginia, didn't look like one of the world's most dangerous spies. He was a middle-aged, middle-class, a bit out of shape guy, looked more carefully, and you could see he had a plastic bag in his hand. Now you see it, now you don't. Robert Hansen, an FBI agent with top security clearance, had been betraying his country for almost two decades as a double agent. Starting in 1985, he sold thousands of U.S. classified files to the Russians, including detailed military plans for responding to a nuclear war. He betrayed American operatives, some of whom were executed by the Russians. He even told the Russians about a secret multi-million dollar eavesdropping tunnel under the Soviet embassy. Unknown to Hansen, the FBI was watching on that day, February 18, 2001, when he made a dead drop delivery beneath the bridge in Foxtone Park. And they swarmed and cuffed him. Hansen asked one question when he was caught. What took you so long? Between 1985 and 2001, Robert Hansen had betrayed his country time and time again. The FBI's official statement reveals the depth of his treachery. Here's what they said. A betrayal of trust by an FBI agent who was not only sworn to enforce the law, but specifically to help protect our nation's security is particularly abhorrent. This kind of criminal conduct represents the most traitorous action imaginable against a country governed by the rule of law. It also strikes at the heart of everything the FBI represents, the commitment of over 28,000 honest and dedicated men and women in the FBI who work diligently to earn the trust and confidence of the American people every day. What a bitter phrase that is, describing this man, a betrayal of trust. A man like Robert Hansen makes the headlines in history books, but how many of you know that acts of betrayal happen every day? every day in politics, in business, and in life. Maybe as I mentioned that subject, you're thinking of the time when you were betrayed, when you were damaged by someone who broke trust with you and in the process broke your heart. So what does this have to do with the world of the end? Well, Jesus says, Matthew 24, 10, and then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Jesus said, as you get closer to the time when he comes back, the whole issue of betrayal will become more and more prominent in our culture. Few things in life hurt worse than personal betrayal. If you ask me if anyone has ever betrayed me, I'd have to answer yes. Betrayal is one of the strongest words on the emotional scale. We don't use it lightly. What makes betrayal so raw and painful is that it comes not from our enemies, but from those who we believe to be our friends, even from our family. People can't betray us unless we've allowed them through the grid of defenses into our life, unless we've let down our guard, unless we trusted them. Betrayal exposes and exploits our vulnerability that wounds us because it makes us subject to a double cross. Les Perot wrote this. He said, backstabbers put on a front that appears accommodating, loyal, and even sacrificial. Then, without warning, they raise their knife, and by the time you see the glint of the blade, it's almost always too late. Perhaps you've shared your most private thoughts with someone only to discover that they betrayed your confidence, told somebody else that you didn't want to know. Maybe you paid someone in advance for work or equipment without getting what you'd bargained for. Far more painful is discovering your spouse is cheating on you or a sibling has lied to you. Many people feel betrayed by a dad or a mom who failed to love or respect them or by a business partner who did them dirty. Honestly, I don't know if there's any other pain in life that is worse than being betrayed by someone close to you. My friend Phil Waldrop wrote this. He said, it changes everything. After such an experience, the world is simply a different place, one far darker and crueler than you ever thought possible before. Every evening, people all over the world go to bed with the feeling that they were burned by someone, and the pain lingers for a long time. Many of them seek to forgive and move on, but it's hard and it's painful, and it's a long process. The portraits of betrayal go way back. Let me tell you, there's nothing new about being burned by somebody, by someone doing you dirty is how we usually say it. 
The sin of betrayal goes back to the beginning of human history when the archangel Lucifer turned against his creator and a host of angels followed him. Ever since that point, betrayal has cascaded through the human story like falling dominoes. Adam and Eve were seduced by Satan. Cain betrayed his brother Abel. Jacob double-crossed his brother Esau. Think of how Joseph must have felt when his own brother stripped off his colorful robe, threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery. Delilah betrayed Samson. The Psalms of David are filled with anguish over various acts of betrayal, including an attempted coup by David's own son, Absalom. Psalm 55, 12 and 13 says this, It is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from it. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. There are many more examples in the Bible, but there's only one that matches the horrendous betrayal of Satan against God the Father, and that is the betrayal of God the Son by Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot, the betrayer. Luke 22, 3 and 4 says, Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. When we study the character of Judas in the Bible, he's almost always mentioned with this, this little phrase. I, I'll show you what I mean. Matthew 10, 4, Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Luke 6, 16, Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. John 13, 2, and supper being ended, the devil having already put it into his heart, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Now put yourself on the Mount of Olives, where this whole thing is happening, where Jesus is talking to his four disciples. The sun is descending in the western sky, and Jesus knew that within hours he would experience the most infamous act of betrayal in history. He must have known that as he quietly warned these that a spirit of betrayal was coming, that he himself would experience the sting of it before the day was over. The pain of betrayal and the portraits of it and the prophecy of betrayal, that brings us back to our verse Matthew 24, 10, and then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Have you noticed how many of Jesus' prophetic promises in the Olivet Discourse are connected to emotional wounds? Prophecies about more than earthquakes and pestilence and heavenly signs. It's about offenses and betrayal and hatred, things that happen every day, even now. Every word of Jesus is intentional, so we're not going to leave any of them out. We'll follow through the three things that he said are going to happen around betrayal. First of all, he said, the time of the end will be a time of offense. This is a really interesting word in the language of the Greek. The word offend is the word scandalizo. It's the word from which we get the word scandal or scandalize. The term is used 30 times in the New Testament. And it refers to a hidden foot trap in the ground that causes someone to stumble and fall. I'm sure at some point in your life, you've been walking along and didn't see a broken piece of concrete or a root in the ground, and it tripped you up and sent you sprawling. That's the picture Jesus painted with the term scandalizo. The idea has to do with Satan using other people around us to set traps for us. The Lexham English Bible says, and then many will be led into sin. For example, when a Christian engages in some particular habit of sin, he or she tries to take others down the same road. Have you know that? Sin wants company. Sin doesn't want to be alone because company gives it a kind of sense of being okay. When preachers begin departing from sound teaching of Scripture, others are tripped up. When a well-known Christian personality transgresses morally, it causes some to become cynical. When a Christian institution is exposed for ethical failure, it sends a number of believers stumbling forward and flailing the air with their arms. When a preacher, a church, or a denomination begins to minimize a sinful trend in society, it gives a weaker believer a license to engage in that sin. Jesus said that in the end, and he's not talking to people outside the church. He's saying in the end, people who are in the church are going to live so carelessly that by their actions, they will cause other people to stumble. They will offend others. They will scandalize them. They will cause them to uh, take the wrong direction. And, you know, 
I don't want to get personal about anybody that you and I know that you've read about in, in recent days, but it just seems like we've lived through an awful lot of that in recent days, everywhere you look. You know, the Bible says that Satan goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And one day I realized what that really means is this. I mean, he's not going to devour you physically. He's not going to eat you up. But the word devour there is a reference to Satan's desire to destroy your influence. Why does Satan go after people in leadership? Because if he takes them down, he takes down their influence, and it affects a lot of people. It's a scandal. That's what we call it, isn't it? It's a scandal. Satan loves to scandalize people because when he takes down someone with influence, he not only gets that person, but he gets all the other people over whom he has influence. That's why as leaders, as preachers, as teachers, we should pray every day that God would protect us from the enemy. I know that many of you pray for me like that, and I'm so very thankful because it means a lot. So to offend someone in the biblical sense of scandalize means to allow the spiritual failure of another person to affect you. Jesus warned that this trend would grow and increase as we move toward the end. There would be more frequency, more intensity, more of this is going to happen. And we're watching it. It's happening more. And you say, well, no, that's just because we have Internet and we have better communications. I don't think so. I think it's just, it's just where we are. And the Bible says that's what's going to happen, a world of offense. And then Jesus says in the same verse, he said, a world of betrayal. Now, the word betrayal is a common word in the New Testament used 121 times. It's translated into a lot of English words like deliver, betray, give over. In the context of Matthew 24, it paints the picture of Christians trying to escape persecution or justify themselves by delivering or handing over other Christians to be judged. In other words, you give up your friends so you can be safe. You betray your friend in order to protect yourself. Once again, the saddest part of Matthew 24:10 is the phrase, one another. You say, why is that so sad? Well, this is not people outside of the church betraying Christians. No, this is Christians betraying Christians. Christians betraying one another. More accurately, people who claim to be Christians betraying those who really are. Earlier, I listed some infamous examples of betrayal in the Bible, but there's one more that you probably don't know about that's kind of hidden in Paul's writings, but it's pretty insightful, so I'm going to tell you about it. It's about a guy named Alexander. He was called Alexander the coppersmith. Many commentators believe we first meet this guy in 1 Timothy 1.20 when he was saying untrue things about God among the churchgoers in Ephesus. Paul removed him from the church along with another heretic named Hymenaeus. Paul delivered them, according to 1 Timothy 1.20, to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Boy, you don't want to be delivered to Satan, but Paul did that to these two dudes. What happened isn't certain next, but many commentators believe Alexander harbored a deep bitterness toward Paul and at some point betrayed Paul's whereabouts to the Roman authorities. And this led to Paul's final arrest, perhaps in Troas. And all this took place during the most dangerous days the church had yet experienced when Emperor Nero declared Christians as public enemies of the Roman government. If this scenario is correct, Alexander's betrayal led to the imprisonment, the trial, the execution of the greatest evangelist and missionary in Christian history. In the final chapter known to be written by Paul, which is in 2 Timothy, here's what he said. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come and the books, especially the parchments. Now watch. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Paul never forgot what Alexander did. I don't know what he did. He hurt him deeply. I don't know if he ever got it right or not, but I do know he hurt Paul. He betrayed him. And we see current evidence of Christians being betrayed by family members and neighbors, even by so-called Christian brothers and sisters. We've seen terrible persecution is afflicting the church. We talked about that last time. Intense pressure is sometimes placed on believers to give up the names of other Christians. 
Sounds like what may happen during the tribulation when raw evil will operate on steroids. The machinery of the Antichrist will seek to track down every new believer and force from them the names of other converts. But as we've seen, the birth pains are already occurring. Some of that is beginning to start. And then he says it will be a world of hatred. As appalling as betrayal is, hatred is even worse. You say, well, pastor, what do you mean by that? Some, someone may be tricked into betraying you, or they may do so out of weakness, but when the motivation is hatred for you, it's a new level of evil. Jesus said, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Now, this is the second time Jesus has mentioned hate. Back in verse 9, he warned that the world would hate us. We don't like that, but we can almost understand it because the, the Bible says if it hated Jesus, it's going to hate us if we're Jesus followers. But in verse 10, he warned Christians that there would be hatred by other Christians toward them, hatred within the body of Christ. And that kind of extreme hating will become commonplace in the world of the end. Even within the established church, some Christians or fraudulent Christians during that time will fulfill the words of John, but he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. The pain of betrayal, the portraits of it, the prophecy of it. That's what's going to happen in the future. That's going to be a part of the culture in the future. You, you see little pieces of it here and there. Don't, don't get surprised. The Bible says this is, this is going to happen. It will be full-blown in the future, even though we're only seeing little bits and pieces of it now. But I don't want to ever leave these messages without answering the question, so what do we do? Well, first of all, choose your friends carefully. It's amazing how we're influenced by the friends we choose when we're 13 or 19 or any other age, how easily we're drawn into unhealthy relationships. I mean, I know friendships go through ups and downs, but we need friends who will remain loyal to God and to us when all is said and done. I'm going to give you some verses about friendship that I think are really helpful. These are tucked away in the book of Proverbs, and you wouldn't find them unless somebody pointed them out to you. But listen to this. Proverbs 12:26 says, The righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. <laughs> do your friends help you draw closer to God, or do they push you away from God? That's the question you need to ask. When I'm with my friends, do they make me want to love God more and be a better Christian, or are they pulling me away from my love for God and being a Christian? If you have friends that are taking you in the wrong direction and you follow them, guess what? You're going to end up where they end up, in the wrong place, destroyed, betrayed, and they don't care. And, you know, you can have a friendship with somebody who's not a Christian if you're leading them toward Christ and not being led by them away from Christ. But that's the key. If you're not leading them to Jesus, they're leading you away from Jesus, and you're going to end up in a place you don't want to be. Here's another verse in Proverbs that says this, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. What happens with your friend when you're going through a tough time? Are they there helping you? Are they there encouraging, or are they off to play games somewhere else? Difficulty sorts things out, doesn't it? You look up and say, oh, look who's still here. And whatever happened to old Joe? <laughs> we need friends who will be honest with us, friends who will tell us the truth, friends who will keep us from mistakes or missteps. Here's another proverb. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The best way to avoid people who are stumbling blocks or betrayers or hateful is to nurture a handful of rich relationships with people who are sold out to Jesus Christ. If they are loyal to him, guess what? They'll be loyal to you. That's the key. That's the test. Find people who are loyal to Jesus, connect with those people, and they'll be loyal to you. So choose your friends carefully and stay focused on your purpose. Here's an interesting thing about Jesus. Do you know what Jesus did when he was betrayed? You should read it, because if you're not looking for it when you read it, it'll just pass right by you. So let me help you. Jesus, he knew what Judas was going to do, and Judas had left the upper room to inform officials where Jesus was. And Jesus knew this. He knew Judas was up to this. But Jesus had stuff to do before this happened, so he didn't run off and hide someplace or go get help. 
The Bible says he gave the disciples the greatest sermon of his life. In the Kidron Valley, Jesus offered his longest prayer recorded in the Bible, John 17. In the middle of betrayal, Jesus remained focused on his purpose. He knew it was coming. We don't know it's coming. It hits us blind. But Jesus knew it was coming, and he preached his longest sermon and prayed his longest prayer and just kept marching forward. You know, that's what we have to do. Even later, after he was arrested because of Judas' betrayal, Jesus remained steady in the awful work before him. He didn't let the betrayal derail him. Instead, he continued forward even to the cross. Hebrews says that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When you get betrayed, you can get all inside yourself and why did God let this happen to me and get on your own case. The Bible says betrayal's going to come and you're going to feel it. Somebody's going to do something that'll hurt you. What do you do? Keep your eyes on the goal and keep marching forward. You will discover that when you do that, it's the greatest therapy for how you feel there could ever be. If you stop and pout and think about it, it can take you out of the game and you don't want that to happen. Betrayal can be so painful, so agonizing, that we're unable to focus on anything else. We don't let it go. Our hearts get bitter. We chew on the possibility of revenge. We make up speeches. I've made up a few speeches in my car and preached them out loud to people who've hurt me. What a dumb thing to do. When you're betrayed, choose to focus not on yourself, but on your purpose. Be like Jesus. Choose to live above the mindset of bitterness Pour your life into the work God has called you. This is the best way to say it. Staying focused on your purpose will allow you to keep your pain in perspective, and you won't get lost. Third, choose your friends carefully. Stay focused on your purpose. Pursue loyalty. Loyalty and commitment are often unpopular because they require us to think of others rather than ourselves. But the beauty of loyalty counterbalances the bitterness of betrayal. We see evidence of that beauty in this scripture, Revelation 2.10. Do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil's about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation in 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. In a world of betrayal, we need to pursue the kind of loyalty that inspires others to remain faithful in their commitment to Christ. Don't falter or give up doing good so you can concentrate on the bad that's been done to you. You've just now joined the other team, and you don't want to do that. And then this is maybe the hardest one, and I have to honestly tell you, when I put this together, I knew there were a couple of verses in the Bible about this, but I didn't know that the body of work on this particular subject was so large. And I'm going to share it with you because... This may be a hard thing to do, but it is not in doubt as to what the Scripture says. We know from Jesus that people will betray us, even people who call themselves Christians. This is going to happen. We can count on it. With that in mind, how should we respond? This is one of those questions to which the Bible gives a very simple answer, and it gives it over and over again. Proverbs 25, 21, and 22. If your enemy is hungry give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink, for so you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Matthew 5, 43. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And we're right about ready to say at this point, are you kidding me? And then there's Romans chapter 12. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. This is about the only time some of you ever try to do the Lord's work. He says it's his work to take revenge on the enemies, and you try to do his work. Let him do his work, and you do what you're supposed to do. And then there's 1 Peter 3, 9. Did you know this was all here? Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. 
The Bible says we are to flip the script and take this out of the hands of the enemy and take control of it. How do we do that? When people hurt us, we go out of our way to find a way to bless them. Maybe the hardest one for me has always been, it says, pray for those who spitefully use you. And I'm sure there have been a lot of strange prayers offered up in response to that encouragement. Lord, I know I'm supposed to pray for this guy, what he did to me. I don't really want to do it, but bless him if you can. <laughs> you know, I'm telling you, that's kind of the way it is when we're really honest, isn't it? So do good to those who hate you. That's how you deal when you're betrayed. Don't, don't act in kind. Here's what we do. Somebody hurts us, and we want to hurt them worse. And if we do, then they find a way to hurt us worse. And it keeps going down and down and down. And you have to draw a line in the sand and say, not on my watch. It's not going to happen on my watch. I'm going to turn this thing around. And if he wants to mock me because I took a pie over to him instead of getting mad at him, that's his problem. I tell you, most of the time, it just melts people and they don't know what to do. And then number five, count on the character of God. That brings me to this final suggestion. This was the conclusion Joseph made after years of processing his brother's betrayal. Here's what I love. This is Genesis 50. Most of you know this. Do not be afraid, for I am in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God, God meant it for good in order to bring about it as this this day to save many people alive. When Paul was sold out by Alexander the coppersmith, He pressed on to write his final book, 2 Timothy, with the resolution of finishing his race and keeping the faith. And that final epistle contains these words. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Perhaps the key to processing the betrayal we experience as followers of Jesus Christ is reckoning that for every person who deserts us, God has blessed us abundantly with more people that don't desert us and with his own unending faithful love. Friends are going to fail us. We're human. And some of you have those stories, and maybe you talk about them now and again. Don't let them be a part of your history. Don't let them define you. Don't be defined by what other people do to you. Be defined by what you do in the name of Christ to be an encouragement for other people. In 1850, John Gray arrived with his family in the city of Edinburgh, Scotland. Though he was a gardener by trade, there was a shortage of work in the city. So John joined the Edinburgh police force as a night watchman, and every evening he walked the streets to ensure the safety of the people of that little village. John Gray did not walk alone, however. His constant companion was a little Sky Terrier named Bobby. No matter the temperature or the weather outside, John and Bobby could be seen walking together through the streets at night, alert for any trouble or any cry for help. After many years of performing his job with dedication, John Gray died from tuberculosis. He was buried in a cemetery called Greyfriars Kirkyard within the city. Bobby the Terrier refused to leave his master's side. Every day he came to spend long hours lying by John's grave. At first, the Kirkyard gardener attempted to shoo him away. But after months of witnessing Bobby's faithfulness, the gardener made a small shelter so the little dog could be out of the weather while continuing his silent vigil. The dog was later named Greyfriars Bobby, and he visited his master's grave every day for 14 years until he also passed away. The residents of Edinburgh erected a granite fountain outside the cemetery with a statue of Bobby on the top. You can still read his headstone today. Greyfriars Bobby died 14th of January, 1872, aged 16 years. Let his loyalty and devotion be a lesson to us all. The Romanian Revolution of 1989 brought to an end the brutal reign of Nicolae Ceausescu and his wife, Elena. And the entire story can be wrapped up in one word, 
The word is deception. From the very beginning, Ceausescu's 24-year rule was saturated with falsehood. He deceived the Romanian people when he described the utopian vision of the nation that he planned to build, promising the end of oppression and the beginning of prosperity. And of course, instead of that, he delivered an iron hand that crushed his own people and squeezed his own nation dry. Nikolai lauded himself as a man of unprecedented talent in the world, claiming the titles of the supreme embodiment of God, hero of heroes, worker of workers, and first personage of the world. And Alina, his wife, made sure the Romanian press referred to her as a model to be followed up by all the women in our country, the legendary mother and the most just woman on earth. Those were words of deception. Those who were deceived by Romania's leaders were not limited to Eastern Europe either. They basically deceived the whole world. Queen Elizabeth knighted Ceausescu. The United States government granted his country most favored nation trading status. And former Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin credited Ceausescu with mediating Anwar Sadat's peace mission to Jerusalem. In reality, the Ceausescu's were as evil as Hitler. They just didn't have the opportunity to work on as grand a scale. They were, in every sense of the word, liars and master manipulators. Deception is common in our world today. And it's also a frequent topic throughout scriptures. And while the practice of deceit began in Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden, it seems to occupy an especially significant place in the prophetic passages of the New Testament. When the disciples came to Jesus asking him about the future, Jesus began his response with this serious warning. Here's what he said. Take heed that no one deceives you. Take heed, said Jesus, that no one deceives you. The status of deception in the world of the end. According to Jesus, deception will play a major role in the world of the end. While we should always be on the alert for lies and misdirection, the Lord warned us to be especially watchful for spiritual deceit as the day of his return approaches. Matthew 24, 23 and 24 reads like this. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive. If possible, even the elect. Jesus specifically instructed his disciples not to follow or fall for these false claims. If the idea of people claiming to be the Messiah sounds strange or far-fetched, know that even in the first century there were several who made that claim. Fifty years after the fall of Jerusalem, a false Messiah came on the scene. The Jews were now ready to follow anyone who would lead them in a new revolt against Rome. So when the courageous fighter Barcoba appeared, he naturally took on himself the aura of the long-awaited Messiah. He said, here I am. I am your Messiah. On one occasion, Barcoba supposedly caught a stone from a Roman catapult and threw it back. And when the current rabbi heard about that, he exclaimed that this man must really be the king, the Messiah, and gave him the name bar Koba, which is taken from Numbers chapter 24. It means there shall come forth a star. So he was anointed as the Messiah. Of course, he was not the Messiah. And his rebellion ended in tragedy for God's people. The bar Koba revolt was also known as the second Jewish rebellion, and it was put down by the Romans in AD 135 when Hadrian led Roman legions to once again destroy Jerusalem and the surrounding area. It resulted in the death of over a half a million Jewish people because of his deception. In every century since the first, men and women, there have been imposters who have claimed to be the Messiah. 
But that is not the only deception about which Jesus cautions. In his sermon, he says to his disciples in verse 11, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. For every one imposter who claims to be the Messiah, there are at least 10 false prophets who will rise up to claim knowledge they do not have about a future they cannot know. They are false prophets. For example, back in 1843, a New Englander named William Miller came to ardently believe that Jesus Christ was going to return. Unfortunately, he began to speculate about the date of that return using dubious mathematical calculations. He collected mounds of data, he analyzed it, and was certain he had made no mistakes. He confidently announced to his followers that on March 21st, 1843, Jesus Christ would return to the earth. At midnight on the appointed day, Miller's devoted followers donned their ascension robes, trekked into the mountains, and climbed towering trees to get as high as possible so they would have less distance to travel through the air. (laughs) But the day came and went, and the Lord did not return, and the trees became really uncomfortable. And so a dejected band of Millerites trudged home to a late breakfast on March the 22nd, accompanied by the jeers and catcalls of their neighbors and friends. It was a sad and bitter day for those deeply disappointed men and women. But Miller is just one example of many false prophets in history. Frankly, when we read that false prophets based their predictions on their study of the Scripture, I can't help but wonder what Bible they were studying. Because, you see, if there's one truth about which we can be absolutely certain, it is this. The date of our Lord's return is unknown and unknowable by anyone on this earth. Scripture makes that very clear. Here are just a representative three verses. Matthew 24, 44, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Matthew 25, 13, Watch therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Mark 13, 32, but of that day and hour no one knows. Listen to this. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Did you know that when Jesus was on this earth, Jesus did not know when he would return? Somebody said, how could that be true? Wasn't he the Son of God? Wasn't he omniscient? Yes, he was, but for the time he was on this earth, he voluntarily divested himself of the independent use of his attributes so while he was on the earth he lived as a man he knows now and he's looking forward to it but when he was on this earth jesus did not know when he would return the angels do not know when he will return so here's my question if jesus doesn't know while he's on this earth and the angels do not know how in the world did you find out I mean, it is so ridiculous because it is so clear. I've read three verses. I think there are 12 verses in Matthew, Mark, and Luke where it says you cannot know the hour. We should always be ready for the return of Christ, but we should never give dates. Miller did it and many others did it. Whenever you hear somebody say they know when Jesus is coming back, you know they are wrong because you cannot know that. And the scripture says that very plainly. So no matter how orthodox we may be, no matter how committed we are to the Word of God, no matter how much we think we could not be vulnerable to deception, history teaches us that even faithful men and women have become susceptible to the deception of the enemy. Jesus said, be careful that you be not deceived. That danger will increase greatly as we move nearer to the world of the end. That's the status of deception. Here's the source of it. The spiritual deception that Jesus warns us about isn't mere happenstance. There is someone behind these deceptions, and that someone is none other than Satan, the evil enemy of our souls. He is the father of lies. And since the very beginning of human history, one of his primary weapons against us has been deceit. In the book of Revelation, John describes him like this. 
the great dragon, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Here's what Jesus said about Satan in John 8, 44. He said he was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Spiritual deception may be Satan's most insidious weapon against those of us in the church. Jesus and his apostles speak of it nearly 30 times in the New Testament. Did you know that? Satan is a liar. He's a serpent. He's a deceiver. But he masquerades as something else, and so do those who follow in his footsteps. Here is what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in his second letter and the 11th chapter. He said, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Deception has always been the weapon of choice of our enemy. And when this deception is full-blown in the period surrounding the rapture, it will be unlike anything that has ever happened before on this earth. But the birth pangs of deception will be felt throughout the earth before the rapture, And many prophetic scholars believe they are being felt already today. While I don't consider myself a prophetic scholar, I believe the deception birth pangs have already begun. Have you experienced the increasing saturation of deception in our society? I know the answer has to be yes. We feel it when politicians regularly fail to follow through on campaign promises. We feel it when media personalities tell us that up is down and dark is light. We feel it when scientists make outlandish claims about basic biology that do not stand up to common sense. We feel it when governments practice censorship in the name of protection and persecution in the name of peace. Someone asked me one time, how in the world will the Antichrist ever deceive the whole world? You know what? We're preparing the way for him. We really are. If we can be deceived as blatantly as we're being deceived right now, the Antichrist is going to have a heyday. It won't be hard for him. If he says it, we'll believe it. The status of deception in the world of the end and the source of it and the strategy of deception in the world of the end. If you have your Bibles with you, I hope you will find your place in the third chapter of Genesis. I want to take you through Satan's strategy. This will impact you if you listen carefully. Someone will say it convicts you. Well, you know, conviction always comes before change, so that's good. The Apostle Paul told the Corinthians, we are not to be ignorant of Satan's devices, 2 Corinthians 2.11. As followers of Jesus, we need to know our enemy so that we can stand against his schemes, including the scheme of deception. Thankfully, we can learn a great deal about Satan's strategy by studying God's Word. The strategy Satan implemented in the Garden of Eden is the exact same strategy he tried to use on Jesus Christ in the wilderness, Matthew chapter 4. And it's the same strategy he uses on you and me today, and it's the same strategy he will use in the end times. Satan's only got one plan. He's only got one game plan, one strategy. He uses it over and over and over again, and if you want to know what it is, you can find it out, and then you can be a little more prepared not to let it happen to you. So I'm going to show you how he works. First of all, Satan disputes God's Word. The first thing Satan did when he tempted Adam and Eve was to dispute God's word. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Satan immediately tried to water down what God had said, to change it just a little. He suggested to Eve that she may not have heard God correctly. (laughs) Here is how this happens to us today. We have the clear, plain Word of God in front of us. It tells us we shouldn't do something we would really like to do. 
And the next thing we know, someone sidles up to us and tries to give us an alternative interpretation of the text that will allow us to do what we know God doesn't want us to do. That is a moment of decision. We have to choose at that moment either to accept the truth of God's word as it is written or to allow ourselves to be deceived. Satan told Eve that God didn't really mean what he said. Then Satan denies God's word. Next, Satan said to Adam and Eve, you shall not surely die. Wait a minute. The road from doubt to denial is not very long. And when Satan said, you shall not surely die, he was brazenly contradicting what God had said. See for yourself, Genesis 2:17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, what does it say, class? You shall surely die. It is important to note the sequence here. Doubt opens the door to denial. If Adam and Eve had not listened to Satan in the beginning, they would not have been victimized in the end. And every time you try to find an interpretation of Scripture that will permit you to do something you know is wrong in your heart, every time you give a little ground up to the enemy, you open the door until Satan can drive a truck through that opening and dump a load of stinking garbage in your life. And he will do it every time. Satan disputes God's word, and then he denies God's word, and then he displaces God's word. He said to them, if you do this, you will be like God. He, he told them, if you do what God told you not to do, you will be like God. Can you believe that? I mean, if you just put that out there in, in a little circle and there's nothing around it, you'd notice it, but it's kind of buried in the context. Satan was putting into their minds the same disturbing thought that had once entered his own mind, the same impulse that had transformed him from the anointed cherub to the devil of hell. That is the master strategy of Satan. He first disputes, he then denies, and then he displaces the word of God. One of the easiest places to see Satan at work in the world today is to observe how our culture treats sin. How innocent it seems to shift aside the pure truth of Scripture when doing it suits our purpose. For instance, lying doesn't seem bad if we're trying to spare another person's feelings. Adultery doesn't feel as wrong when we describe it through doublespeak as an improper relationship. Gluttony and addiction aren't the result of personal choices, but genetic disorders or chemical imbalances. When we allow Satan to sow doubt in our minds that some sins are really not sins after all, we have opened our hearts to his deception. Quickly then, right and wrong get turned upside down, and God's word is replaced with our own wisdom. He disputes God's word, he denies God's word, he displaces God's word, and then he discounts God's goodness. This is really subtle, but please notice. Genesis 2, 16 and 17, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Notice how generous God is. An abundance of goodness was offered freely, just one restriction. Yet look at how Eve reframed God's original command when she spoke with Satan in Genesis chapter 3. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Do you see what's missing? Eve omitted God's gracious provision that she and Adam could freely eat of every tree in the garden. In other words, her comprehension of God's provision was not merely as magnanimous as God intended it to be. Satan had gotten to her with his evil implication about God. Listen carefully. When you start to question the grace and goodness of God, you are on the road to deception. Don't allow Satan to push you into thinking God has abandoned you or that he has not been good to you. It's when you open the door to those kinds of thoughts that you'll find Satan has sown his seeds of deception in your heart. Let me ask you a question. Is God good? Has he been good to you? Have you had a good week? You probably had some problems like I have, but it's been a great week. And God is good. And life is good when you walk with the Lord. 
But Satan doesn't want you to believe that. He wants you to believe God is a stingy, compromising person. The Bible tells us that Satan disputes God's word, he denies God's word, he displaces God's word, then he discounts God's goodness, and he dramatizes God's restrictions. How many times I've heard young people uh, talk about this. Adam and Eve not only discounted God's goodness, they dramatized God's restrictions. Perhaps I should say they over-dramatized God's restrictions. They added to them. Nowhere do we find that God told the first humans not to touch the forbidden tree. But Eve said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Again, God never said that. He made no mention of touching. What difference does that make, you say? Isn't that kind of nitpicking? Isn't that kind of silly? No, it's a good question. And I think the answer is that when you give Satan an inroad into your life, you will soon be thinking less of the grace of God and more of the law of God. You'll be focused on what you can't do rather than what you've been enabled to do. And the next thing you know, you begin to think God doesn't really care about you and maybe he isn't interested in your welfare at all. So what difference does it make? I should just do whatever I want to do. That is how deception gets into your lives. Almost every week of my life as a pastor, I've seen that demonic process play out. It happens to young people. It happens to older people. It happens to new Christians and individuals who have been in the church for years, to the rich and to the poor, to the highly educated and to the high school dropouts. Whenever we overemphasize the boundaries in our lives, we allow ourselves to be deceived. And then, this is the last one, Satan diminishes God's penalty. Eve said, lest you die. Now that's not what God said. God didn't say, lest you die. God said, you will surely die. (laughs) Verse 17 says, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall eat, for in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Eve left out the surely die part and changed it to a simple lest you die. And the latter sounds like death is something that might happen. It could happen. It's a possibility. The former makes it clear that death is inevitably connected with sin. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. It's easy for modern Christians to start reading the word of God and see maybe when the text says definitely, or to hear consider when the scripture says obey. When you do that, you leave yourself wide open to the deception of Satan. Listen to me, friends. The devil doesn't want to help you. (laughs) He wants to destroy you. He doesn't want to build you up. He wants to tear you down. He don't want to set you free. He wants to enslave you. And Jesus said this about the devil. He does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So there you have the status of deception in our world today, the source of it and the strategy of it. Here's the solution to it. What is the solution to our world being driven deeper and deeper into deception? What is the answer to Satan's strategy of deceit? You know what the answer is? Simply, it's the truth. That is the answer we need, and that is the answer Jesus provides. We know that because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus doesn't just tell the truth. He's just not about the truth. He is the truth. He is the truth. That means Jesus is utterly dependable and trustworthy. You can take him at his word. When you meet him, you move from false to true, from deception to reality, from relative confusion to absolute knowledge. Let's think practically, though. What can we do in our everyday life that will help lift up the value of truth to a world drowning in deception? Three things. First of all, tell the truth. Let's be frank. Many people feel comfortable with little lies. They call them white lies, minor misdirections. Yes, the check is in the mail. No, officer, I wasn't aware I was driving that fast. I had no idea I wasn't supposed to use my friend's account for that streaming service. As a culture, 
We have convinced ourselves that dishonesty is only dangerous if it actively harms another person. We are fooling ourselves because the Scripture says, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Not lying lips that hurt other people. Not lying lips that get you in trouble. Just plain, simple, lying lips are an abomination. The Lord does not want us to lie. And all deceit is deadly. This is an especially deadly and dangerous trap for Christians. We see our culture becoming more and more saturated with major incidents of deception. And when we see that, we become more comfortable with what we believe to be minor lies. We think it's just a little bit dishonest. Not anywhere close to the way my co-workers lie all the time. Yet because of who we are, because of our identity as children of God and ambassadors of the King, even a little deception can cause massive damage to our lives, to our loved ones, to our testimonies. For that reason, let us speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. In the words of Paul, do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Tell the truth. You know, it's so interesting. I've been in the church all my life. My daddy was a preacher, so I'm... I tell everybody I, I had a drug problem. I was drugged to church since I was a little tiny baby and, and I've been going ever since. And so I know the church. I've lived in the church and I know what it's like. And when I first became a pastor back in the 70s, one of the things that was true, when you have a pastor's meeting, you couldn't pray before you told everybody how many you had in Sunday school the day before. And the rumor was that pastors weren't always honest about their numbers. That was a rumor. <laughs> I heard of one discussion that went like this. If I lie about my statistics, and you know that I'm lying about my statistics, and I know that you know that I'm lying about my statistics, isn't that like telling the truth? <laughs> no, it's not like telling the truth. We're supposed to tell the truth, the unvarnished truth. Ask God this week to help you be totally truthful. The whole truth, nothing but the truth. So tell the truth. Then secondly, test the truth. There's an interesting moment in the book of Acts that is helpful when we think about truth and deception. Specifically in terms of the danger that false teachers and false prophets present within the church. Here's the passage. Acts 17, 10 and 11. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Do we do that? Do we search the scriptures daily? You say, oh man, I come to your church, Dr. Jeremiah, and you teach from the Bible. You have my permission to go home and check about what I say. If it's not right, if it's not in the Bible, if I'm not being true, you should, don't send me an email, make an appointment. <laughs> the Bereans did not reject Paul simply because he presented something new. They did not accept what he said simply because he was passionate and knowledgeable. The Bereans invested their time and their energy into determining what was true by studying the scriptures daily. And the Bible tells us that if you go to the scripture and you ask God ahead of time to help you understand it, he will do it. He will help you understand it and you will know whether it's true or not. Have you ever been around somebody who's espousing some new thing? And in your heart, as you listen to it, you're, you're trying to be respectful, but you just feel like in your heart, there's something wrong with that, man. That doesn't sound right. Well, if it doesn't sound right, don't do anything until you can get it to sound right because it'll get you into trouble. Oftentimes, the Holy Spirit who lives within us helps us to recognize error that we can't even explain to ourselves. We just know in our heart that is not actual. That is not true. And what you don't want to do is to let untruth into your life. So 
don't just tell the truth, test the truth. 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Tell the truth and test the truth, and then teach the truth. One way for us to stand against deception is to tell the truth at every opportunity. Another is to test what the world and even the church tells us is true. But finally, we can lift up truth in a world of deception by teaching the truth. Teach it to those who need to hear it. The Bible tells us in the book of Colossians that as believers, we're to teach one another. We're to teach the truth in such a way that we lift people up, help them understand we have been called by Almighty God to be a part of His forever family. Recently, a 67-year-old woman was caught shoplifting in the city of Stockholm, Sweden. Her method was to place grocery items in a woven bag, a Christmas ham, meatballs, sausages, cheese, and more. And then she attempted to leave the store while covering those items with another bag, and the clerk noticed what the woman was doing and confronted her. Now, here's the really strange part. The woman in question was one of the justices on Sweden's Supreme Court. On the one hand, this woman's crime was relatively minor. I mean, for many around the world, shoplifting is not a big deal. Here in California, it's almost expected that people will steal from stores and suffer no consequences. So this woman had not transgressed the law in a major way. But listen carefully. Because of her status, because of who she was, because of her identity as a representative of the law and her nation's highest court, she was forced to resign and was prosecuted for her theft. My challenge to us all is this. We cannot change the world. I don't know when it was, but sometime, probably in the last 10 years or so, I gave up on that. I, I can change the world one soul at a time. You can't change the world politically. You can't change the world by any other means. The world is changed one person at a time when people receive Christ. I feel badly for so many people who spend all of their time as Christians trying to change the world. I dare you to find one passage in the New Testament where the Christians were trying to change the Roman world. They lived in that world. And so here's what I want you to understand clearly. Jesus' message to his four disciples on the Mount of Olives, telling them what was going to happen in the future, was not given to make them smarter about what would happen, but to help them understand what would happen so they could be the people God wanted him to be in the midst of that situation. That is the whole force behind this series of messages. I don't want you to be smarter about the future, although there's nothing wrong with that. I want you, I want me, I want to be the person God wants me to be so that no matter what happens, I can be his person and be a difference maker in the world in which I live. To the vast majority of moderns, there is no such thing as objective truth. We create our own truth, they say. You have your truth, I have my truth, and your truth is no truer than mine. Satan has effectively inserted this false definition of truth into our culture. It's in our schools, and it's even in some of our churches. But you cannot be a genuine Christ follower if you embrace this idea. Listen to me. Every true Christian should know and love the truth. Scripture says one of the key characteristics of those who perish, people who do not go to heaven, is that they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And the clear implication is that a genuine love for the truth is built into saving faith. It is therefore one of the distinguishing qualities of every true believer in Jesus' words, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So what I want to say to all of us today, I say to myself first and before I say it to you, and those who are listening on the internet or wherever this is heard, don't spend your life trying to undo the deception of the world. You are not strong enough, big enough, influential enough. But what you can do is you can follow Solomon's advice. He said, buy the truth and do not sell it. 
Isn't that a great verse? I love that verse. Solomon said, buy the truth. Don't sell it. So this week, let's not only buy the truth, let's be the truth. Let's tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Let's stand against the things that are false by standing up for the things that are true. Let's stop posturing and actually be the people we want people to think we are. This is what I know as we ease into the days that Jesus is telling us about in Matthew 24. The world is watching, and it is time for us to be the truth. 3 John 3 and 4, John wrote to this little congregation to whom he was writing 14 verses in that chapter, and six times the word truth is found in that book. Here's what he said. I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Let's be people of the truth this week. When we catch ourselves starting to move away from that, let's catch ourselves up short and say, no, in this deceptive world, I will be the truth. If I never say anything to anybody, if I never get in a conflict with anybody,